Hello everyone. In today's episode of Talking Straight with Sham, uh, we talk on a lot of topics on this auspicious occasion of Diwali. So without wasting much time, let's dive straight into it. Hi, Hi Sham. Hi. How are you? Good. So uh, Sham, uh, it's a good time to talk. It's Diwali, so it's a great time to talk about a lot of things. So let me dive straight into it. So Sham, you've been a career investor and you've been a small cap investor. Almost three and a half decades now, right? Uh, and you would have seen many ups and downs, many different periods of the economy, different geopolitical situations, etc. So, and you've handled them all very successfully. So, I mean, in your career and in your uh, view, what are the key things that you sort of attribute for a successful investor and a successful small cap investor? However, you want to put it. I think uh, the most important thing uh, in investing itself is longevity. You have to stay in the game long. Uh, and to ensure that uh, you must have uh, the process that keeps you away from trouble. That's the primary. Do we actually manage to always avoid trouble? I think not. Uh, you will always have something out of the blue which will hit you even in the companies where you have very high confidence and faith. Uh, the unknown unknowns are very, very high in investing because we are not running the company. We don't have the kind of ringside view into businesses which uh, probably entrepreneurs are expected to have. So ours is always a rather inefficient way of uh, understanding and participating in businesses. So, in that while we cannot hope to get perfection, right. we still should not be horribly wrong. So, that is the mm -hmm. most important thing if one has to do investing itself. Right. In that small cap investing is more difficult because the quality of information available is low in the public domain. I am talking about the information available in the public domain. The quality of information is low. If you are one of those who gets very cozy with the promoter, which I am not habituated to being, then you are going to get too much information, some high quality, some mediocre quality and some actual low quality information. Like what you sh should not think or know, the promoter thinks like a glass, he will you know, transmit it to you. Right. You can see through it. Yeah. So these are the risks that happen when you get close to the investor. So, if you are away from the investor, invest like I am generally habituated to, your access or understanding can at times be flawed. Right. If you are too close like many of the current generation investors are, chances are that uh, you can make bigger mistakes than even people like us. Right. So, you have to understand both extremes right. and try to form your own middle ground if you want to be a successful small cap investor. Right. There is no escaping the fact that we are going to have excess information mm. in the future. Right. So, the era where I invested in small caps was where you had very little information and we used to do scuttlebutt, right. go and talk to customers, go and talk to the market uh, where the company is in, right. go and talk to vendors. And if in some instance the company is giving a transparent uh, you know, visibility in the AGM, right. then we would go to the AGMs. But right. I can't remember when I last attended an AGM. I think you were there in the AGM, KRBL. Yeah. I don't know when it was, more than That's a decade. Right, yeah. Yeah. So, after that, I have not gone to AGM. I got so frustrated that I don't want to attend right. any AGM. Right. And this is not the way to conduct a shareholder assembly. And most people are like that. I think most AGMs are uh, right. a sham. So, <laughs> you don't get such things, but people think that that is a source of information. There are a lot of people who go and do right. a lot of things in these uh, places also. Right. So, you are going to have too much of information. Information overload is there. Right. Uh, you have to pick, which means that uh, it's doubly challenging than information scarcity. So, you, you talked about two things. Right? One is obviously information, but you started with the fact of longevity. When you invest in a small cap or a small company, one is information, but you are also thinking about how the business is going to evolve over the future, right? And the fact is nobody knows, even the entrepreneur who is running the business may not know, but he is working towards the hypothesis and he is trying to execute that. And there may be challenges in that execution. And 
in that and that sort of also conflates with what is happening around the world and it can the markets may go up and down and hyper uh, analyze that and a lot of things can happen so even if you look at all the companies which are big today they have also they were at some time small cap and they've gone through their ups and downs in terms of share price as an investor how do you handle the stomach to handle such things where you can see your uh, the stock that you as you said conviction also you still you can go wrong or temporarily you can go wrong so how do you handle the stomach to be able to uh, seek these kinds of drawdowns is it inevitable see i think uh, the general dna of small cap investor has to be somebody who has a very high stomach for risk so you must be willing to be completely humiliated and defeated mm. uh, if you want to be a sustainable small cap investor i know there are a lot of small opportunistic investors who make a lot of money in one cycle and then in the next cycle right. they get uh, you know kind of marginalized in the next bear right. market i've seen many like this right. but those who survive are those who have to stay multiple cycles right. so i'll give you an example most of the companies which we bought uh, as penny stocks mm. Uh, when their valuations were very very low, the stock price was between uh, say between twelve and twenty. Went down to four digit. Wow. Stock price went to four digit. Right. The market cap, I mean, four hundred, five hundred times. Right. And all this has happened over a span of twenty, twenty two years, right. two decades, which would mean you have to last three cycles, roughly right. two and a half, three cycles. So. If you are going to judge the company so harshly quarter on quarter, right. then you are putting uh, things into your own stomach which your stomach cannot digest. Right. Right. So you have to judge lightly and look at the runway and basically focus on the runway right. and whether the company is executing right. So it's a spectatorship that you have to develop. Whereas investors think that you are making active right. judgments. So, if you see the more successful investors are glorious spectators right. and the mediocre success goes to people who want to prove that they are smarter than others and the lesser than mediocre outcome comes to people who want to prove that they are the cleverest. Okay, So, right. it is kind of counterintuitive. Yeah. You have to do it the other way and not in the conventional way. Right, and and picking on that counterintuitive point, right? I mean, in the last seven years, and probably this is even before that also. But let's pick just last seven years. Uh, we've seen like uh, in seventeen, two thousand seventeen, uh, everybody I met wanted to be a small cap investor, correct? Right, and then after a few months in twenty eighteen, the the scene changed, and over the next couple of years, it was the hated word. I mean, Nifty was going up, and and small cap, and in general, the broader markets were very, very weak, right? Cut to now, there is only one word: you can only make money if you are a small cap investor. That's the general uh, perception right now, right? Uh, we all know how it usually ends, right? So, uh, so somebody who's coming in to the market today, or who's still fresh, uh, who's probably not seen a lot of cycles, how do you? convey this counterintuitiveness or how because it's easiest easy to say that oh when there is greed you have to be fearful and when there is blood on the street you have to go and buy it's all easy to understand from an english point of view how to sort of instill that so in from your experience you as you said you've seen so many cycles how do you get it into your process or into your decision making process or into your behavior how do you get that see newton's third law will apply uh, <laughs> a lot in investing. Right. Every action will have an equal right. and an opposite reaction, especially when you are overacting. Right. Right. So right. when you uh, when you do something which you should not do, the reaction will be very fast. Right. When you do something which you must do, okay, then the success takes a long time to come. But when you do something which you should not do, Newton's third law takes over, mm -hmm. and you will be punished by the market. Right. If you see 2018, that's exactly what happened. Right. Now, the trigger always will come from government and regulatory action. Understand this very clearly. Right. If you think that the bear market of 2018 was a macro phenomenon, you are wrong. It was the categorization of stocks which forced the mutual funds to sell. 
So the one way buyers turn sellers. Correct. Now today, cut to the present. Right. Today the mutual funds and all institutional investors, right. including many like us, yeah. are very hesitant to sell or completely unwilling to sell. We are somewhere in this band, right? Yeah. Um, so when you are not willing to sell and you only want to buy more, there is a one way trade that you mm. see. And when there is a one way trade, everybody wants to only be a small cap investor. Mm. Now what does regulation or government need to do is just disrupt this, which they will mm. by clamping down on funding of investors, again resetting the category. See. Today, the categorization of small cap is wild. Right. Even if you bring a little order to it, right. it will change things a lot. Mm. If you say large cap mutual funds must be true to label, I am giving you some changes which regulators can easily make. Right. If you say large cap mutual funds must be true to label, mm. then large cap funds will not hold small cap stocks. Mm. That will again change. Right. That will create supply. And if you make market cap the basis of categorization of small, mid and large caps. Mm -hmm. That will reset a lot of things. Right. And if you reduce the number of mid cap and small cap companies in f and there are quite a few actually. Right. Right. That will change things quite a bit. Right. And I think that uh, lastly, if you raise the ticket size of investors, Mm -hmm. in something like an SME, oh. that will change the speculation mm. in a lot of these. That's interesting. And you also have the current framework of, uh, you know, restricting speculation. You have the ASM, yeah. which is working quite well. Right. Yeah, people do game it, but overall it seems to be working well. So all these regulatory resets and governmental actions mm -hmm. can suddenly change the mood. Correct. And when the mood changes and people have to sell, right. then you won't want to be only a small cap investor because right. the impact cost will start playing a part. Right. In 2018, when people like us were owning large positions in small companies and then this reset happened and the mutual funds and others had to sell those stocks. Right. The stocks fell not because of the fundamentally weak nature of the business, right. but because somebody was selling without thinking. Right. Whereas we had bought with a certain thought process and investment conviction, but the seller was not applying that, he was just selling blindly. Correct. So now we are having the converse, people are just buying blindly, right? right. So this, uh, this will keep on happening. It will keep on happening. So when this changes, uh, you will uh, change, see a change of mood and it will keep happening. To think it won't happen this time right. is nothing short of delusion. Correct. Correct. The other thing, Chang, I mean, if you, uh, we have seen uh, and, and these things are uh, getting shorter and shorter in terms of cycle. What worked in the last cycle doesn't work in the next cycle. Uh, at the same time, you have to uh, uh, have a long term view in terms of, as you said, you have to have to be able to survive. But at the same time, you have to keep repositioning your portfolio. So what's, what happened in 2017, 18, that whole period, uh, if you had the same portfolio today. If you moved to the same portfolio, probably you wouldn't have done as well as what you did in that cycle. Correct. Right. And probably as you move towards the next next cycle now, it will probably be the same, wherein you have to you have to rethink completely, right? Uh, but at the same time, we say that we need to buy businesses with a punch card kind of a thought process. So how how does this contrast work? So both are relevant, right? Firstly, let's come to this punch card concept, right? So there are some themes which are decadal themes. Sure. Where you have decadal themes, you can do punch card type of investing. Correct. 25 years ago, home finance was a decadal theme. Sure. Then you saw uh, consumption as a decadal theme. Pharma has been a decadal theme. Right. Uh, IT as well. IT has been a decadal theme. So today I think that uh, the Gen Z uh, consumption may be a decadal theme. Sure. Similarly, logistics is a decadal theme. Mm. Food is a decadal theme. Right. I would think retail is a decadal theme. Retailing. Right. In India, both right. e-commerce mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Omni, I'm yeah. talking about both, yeah. Yeah. would be a decadal theme. Right. Travel, in my opinion, is a decadal theme. Sure. Uh, mobility is a decadal theme. Mm -hmm. Infra still remains a decadal theme. Correct. Manufacturing is a decadal theme. 
right so you have multiple decadal themes in these decadal themes if you are going to pick individual stocks which you can hold for 10 or more years right. then you have made it right right but our tendency is to sell the decadal stocks right. to buy something exotic which you like right because you want to keep on finding new things correct it's like uh, the necessity for action right makes you punch more often right so you must know where you have made a punch and you don't need to punch again right and you don't need to punch out once right. you punch in right so when you do that in a decadal theme it works right but where you have made these bets in other places where you need to you know, recognize the fact. Like mm. today, I think wherever government protection is creating a bubble. Right. Many sectors. Sectors where government is the only customer, mm. or sectors where government policy is actually contributing to profit, like protection. Sure. Like anti dumping duty. Right. There you have to bail out. When it's too good to be true, you have to go out. Correct. So you must know where to get out and where to never get out. Right. So, both the principles are valid. You must apply it correctly. Generally, what do we do? We apply it in all way. mixed up. Yeah. Right. So, that is the challenge for us. So, we right. need to avoid that. Correct. Right. So, I mean, this somewhat related. Uh, I mean, success sometimes is the breeding ground for failure. Right. So, you would have done really well in this cycle. It may go to your head or you may not have, as you said, you may not really have assessed the key variables of that success and you may think what is a transient theme and you would you would mistook, mistake it for a decadal theme and and hence by the by the time the cycle plays out you would not have uh, i mean your paper profits would turn into losses and you wouldn't get uh, to really enjoy the profits so when this transition is happening or when you so I guess we all as investors can broadly sense when the cycle is turning. Maybe we are early or maybe we are slightly late. But I guess I think, I don't know if you, if, if you think I'm right here, but broadly we get a sense that things are changing as we keep looking at the markets on a day-to-day -day basis. So when this transition is happening or about to happen, how do you as investors, I mean as, as an investor, how do you change the way you invest? How I mean, there's a time to go fast, there's a time to go slow, there's a time to uh, not do anything, not do anything, right? So, how do you sort of, I mean, if you can, I mean, because you have this moment of extreme success, because that is a good starting point for everyone, right? Fundamentally, success makes you happy for sure. I mean, otherwise, why do you succeed? Right. Correct. So, sometimes it makes you very happy. Mm -hmm. Now, what you do when you're very happy matters. Now, are you going to get too carried away by that happiness or are you going to become afraid of your own success mm. is all personal but i think that you have to deal with it lightly that's very very important mm. and you need to create space in your mind to do new things that's the bigger worry here mm. suppose you're so successful in one team and you have bought 5, 6 stocks and you have milked it, you have killed it. Right. All the stocks have become 10x, 20x, whatever may be the thing. At that point, you feel that team has got more steam first. Mm. You believe the team so much. You don't want to get out of a winning idea. That's the right. second. You may be right on both. Right. But still, you have a need to think beyond that and create mind space for what will work in the future. Right. Because this is what has worked so well in the past and in the present. Correct. Now, this won't be a spectacular thing from here. Correct. It could be a decent story. Correct. For example, if you already had a multi-bagger, chances are from where you stand in the present after super success, you could only be having a compounder. That's your best case. Right. right? So, if you want to think fresh to create future ideas which will create similar success, right. You need to create mind space for that. If you are full of this success in your head, then you will not be able to create mind space. I can also tell you from experience that uh, your mind is full of your past success and what you have done. People will also talk to you all the time only about it. So, they keep you anchored to it. Right. 
True. For example, if you are going and talking on TV, they will always talk you about your success. Yes. Right. You go to any forum, right. people will be tracking you closely. They will only talk about what has worked for you. Right. So, you are also talking always about it. It's like an actor talking about his latest film. Right. But that is not going to help him do the next good film, right? For an actor. Right. Similarly, for an investor, talking about your past success so much right. will not give you mind space to think fresh. Right. So, which means that you have to actually mentally move out of the past success. Mentally, right. you have to wind it down to a level right. where you create space to think of new things. Right. Now, whether you should physically wind down the position also is a debatable thing. Sure. It depends on the idea, your state of mind, what kind of valuations are prevalent. Correct. I am not going there. Right. But definitely mentally, when you are successful, you need to create space. Right. And you need to wind down that success and, you know, kind of put it to sleep. Right. It's like how batsmen say that after 100 you take fresh guard na exactly. same exactly so it's the same thing right right so i mean we were talking about it some time back right i mean the markets are just getting more and more competitive and very and it is only going to be like that Absolutely. right the competition only will keep growing up uh, keep growing right so uh, two things so the basics will not change right this greed and fear will, will be there uh, so long, long term, short termism will always be there, but still, this the makeup of the market is changing, and and there is no reversal to that, right? Uh, so, how do you uh, see this, and how do you change your approach, or is there an, even any change in your approach? Uh, like you said, you used to attend AGM, now you don't need to, right? And uh, uh, there is so much of information to begin with. Uh, so many companies do con calls. Before quarter, they give an update. After quarter, every month, <laughs> yeah, monthly updates are there now. So the information is all there to see. There are more people, uh, more and more people coming into the market, which is a good thing, I feel, in a general way. But how do you sort of, as an investor who's really been at this game for like more, almost three and a half, uh, three and a half decades, so so is there a change in your approach, or do you still do the same? There is a definite. Evolution, you have to change your approach with time. Right. Uh, the competitive landscape will make you change. But you don't change because of it. You change because you like to change for the better. Forced change will not make an investor do better. It's mostly voluntary change that makes an investor do better. Right. So I don't go and study a sector because others are studying it. I study it if I really like it and I see a future in it. So, the individuality is a constant. Mm. But while you keep your individuality, you also learn to appreciate the individuality of a generation of investors who are coming into the market. Right. That's very important. 